functions. And I represent Yakima Valley College at um, various functions, wherever it be appropriate, mainly with the, with Indian education programs. I work out of the counseling department, and our major goal is to educate or help in educating youngsters that leave high school, ad adults, and basic education to continue their careers and their own given objectives to improve their educational background so they can help themselves. The main function would be working with, as I stated, Indians, Yakima Indians, Indians from outside the state of Washington. Um, this could be vocational education and higher education. Our college is a two-year institution named after the Yakima tribe of enrollment of approximately 5,000. This is day and evening. Um, one of their major objections is to bring education from the campus life, traditional setting, down into a non-traditional setting, which would be within the boundaries of the Yakima tribe in reservation. Would it be at Toppenish, White Swan, Wapato, Sadis, wherever we can get student body to attend. Um, and uh, the main function of a college is to render services, educational services. I work there for nine months. And in summertime, I work with the Yakima tribe in the summer school program. In the summer school program, in the past, I've been at director of Wapto Longhouse, portion of the Upper Valley and Lower Valley programs. It's a, this past year, I was Camp Shepherd director up in the mountains and uh, run by the Yakima tribe and in conjunction with the Bureau of Internet Affairs, the overseer was project director as Ray Olney. Okay. How did the program get started and how is it funded? You can speak to the... Well, the junior college program is obviously... Right. Kind of system, but how about the Camp Chaparral program? Um, Camp Chaparral started about 20 years ago, give or take a year or two. It was... It's been there since time of memorial, and it's just been changed into an educational program as in the last latter part of the early part of the 60s. It used to be, as it was labeled, a youth camp. It's just a place for our youth to gather for weekends or seven days a week, and then as it went on, it turned into a summer education supportive program. Camp Chaparral, they averaged approximately 160 students a week. This past year, we had um, a staff of 34 from different programs that help send students there to be teachers and teacher aides, uh, recreation aides, recreation directors. The Bureau of Internet Affairs and the Yakima Tribe picked up the funding this year because someone in Washington, D.C. felt we didn't need the funding, is my uh, synopsis of my feelings about summer school program. The program is very helpful in many different ways. First of all, it's going to bring, and it does, increase the educational background of our students that are participants in the program, kindergarten through 12th grade, if a few 12th graders show up. Generally, it's run uh, first grade through uh, ninth grade. And we run in different sections, age-wise and grade-wise, mainly grade-wise. This past year, we had first graders and a few kindergartens. By the way, we're a non-discriminatory program. Uh, that's including uh, a school attendance and employment-wise. Equal opportunity, in other words. I think we're Indians are more equal opportunity than the non-Indians are. As you can see, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is full of white people. Uh, lack of participation maybe would be an excuse for the white people to talk about Indians participating in running their own federal government and federal programs, but 
Camp Chaparral, we, hi we do hire non-Indians. Um, education has, from the first uh, record keeping of Camp Chaparral, it has grown, because I'm a product of Camp Chaparral. The project directory also a product of Camp Chaparral. Tell us a little bit about how you use culturally related materials and concepts in your summer school program? From one class to another class, it's, um, it overlaps. And we'll start with art program. The arts is broken down into uh, drawing, such as the picture behind us here. We figure that with drawing, you're going to have to have finger dexterity to run that paintbrush. You're going to have to have your eyesight for color coding. Again, you're learning something. From there we go to an example would be beadwork. You're doing your beadwork and again, finger dexterity. The control of the fingers, in fact, both hands. Again, for color coding, eyesight, we can see if you maybe be colorblind. Um, lack of amount of figuring amount of beads, you can have some mathematics involved. Um, we figure you're going to learn something about the cost of purchasing the, the material you're going to use for your artwork. Uh, storytelling comes into play in your beadwork, your war dancing stories, uh, stories about the owl, story about uh, the beaver, stories about nature in general, trees, plants. All this is going to come into that artwork and beadwork. How do you make that certain picture come into, into your uh, drawing? How do you figure the colors are going to come into it? So all of this overlaps. Then from there we go, say, to reading. Reading of, uh, uh, has to be uh, kind of a pro professionalized program. We've got to have uh, professional people that teach reading. Uh, maybe in the Indian background, we may not have a person that could do this, so we hire non-Indians to teach reading. And reading to be able to read the writing, the books, the ACMA language, the number system, ABCs, counting. So all of this will go into that artwork. And we go into uh, mathematics. Mathematics, you have to have count Say you talk about the number of buffalo, if we got uh, Plain Indians. We tell about the stories how the Yakimas in a plateau area, Indians journeyed off into the Great Plain to hunt buffalo. We say they killed 10 buffalo. And we, say, uh, we use the legends. We transplant legends uh, into numbers, play the number games of reading, storytelling, so the student can be able to retain something and we put that into the program. And we go into games. Um, we don't play squash as, as it would have been some time ago. We maybe use uh, kickball or softball, baseball, basketball, different sports, archery, legends about how they played these various games. Legends about, uh, this is all took place in the evening, storytelling, around campfire, uh, in classes. Uh, working with the Northwest Reading Lab from Portland that came into our program. And um, went into science. Uh, science teacher was fairly new to the area, which is good in some cases. We get uh, outside blood that, that uh, don't have their prejudices already built around Indians, and his lack of uh, Indian culture was to our benefit. We oriented him the way we wanted him to be oriented, so he was able to better serve our community that he was to serve. And he used um, different people, if we could find someone, or that knew about how they tanned hides, which was our art teacher. And she explained when they, if they were to cut open a chipmunk, dissect him, they learned from this process into storytelling again, how they used all parts of the uh, animals that were used uh, then when it came to eating, which uh, we all had to do, was uh, 
which was breakfast, lunch, and supper. Again, maybe we'd have someone from the the uh, part of the education program that we called uh, interpersonal communications or uh, speaking class or oratorian class would get up and tell something about what they learned that day and about the different foods or different stories. Uh, this interpersonal communications class was to say, I'm okay, you're okay. So we use psychology, the outside uh, non-Indian tradition of learning within the Indian tradition of learning. So we borrowed what we could borrow that was good for us and incorporated into what benefited the students. Granted, there's a lot that the non-Indians have that are great, but yet we feel the non-Indians are losing a lot and they've got a long ways to come back to gain what they've lost. What's been the effect of this program on the people that it serves, say on the Indian kids that attend the camp and also on their parents and grandparents? Um, for the children that attended camp, I have to say that I think it was one hell of a good experience. Uh, not only for the education that they received, but the uh, will and the desire to go on and compete and uh, accept and receive a college education that uh, supposedly is supposed to make you a, a better and productive uh, person. But uh, with this, when you sit back, you know, you have to, the way I would feel as uh, growing up in a traditional family is received what good I could get out of the an ed college education that would benefit me when I come back to the reservation, because I am a reservation Indian, than to let go what I don't need. Then when you go out into the non-Indian setting, pull that all back in and use it to in improve Indian community that you come from and to help those that need help and to encourage the students that are coming up that we're here to serve and to better they in turn can learn from your experience that hey I'm going to go do what uh, John Doe did to improve myself to better make myself a better productive uh, person for the community that I'm coming from and to help those down the street someplace. Uh, Why do you think there's a need for uh, education about Indian language and culture and tradition uh, among Indian kids, whether they plan to return to the reservation and stay or whether they plan to go out into uh, the, the wider world and work? What uh, value does it, do you think it has for them in the future? For the future, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has done one hell of a good job of destroying Indian communities. Not only the Yakimas, all over the United States. And you can take a look at what happened in Mexico, what happened in Canada. The non-Indians came in and they destroyed, they keep on destroying and they destroyed and destroyed. And you can see what happened not only here, you take a look at what happened to Africa, what happened in China, what happened in uh, the uh, Philippine Islands. Uh, Today, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is trying to correct and undo justices that help defeat a proud set of people, which is the Native Americans. We've been called um, various words that uh, would be appropriate now to use up to what we are now, Indians or Native Americans, whatever you like to be called. Uh, I prefer to be called Yakimas, as maybe the Navajos would be called Navajos. To bring back what we lost would be really hard to do. Can't set a dollar price on it, but our culture has got to be preserved. The only thing they can't take away from us is the culture. Our language is dying so badly that we've got to bring this back. And in order to do so, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has been uh, set down several year, many years ago, 200 years plus, be our guardians, our educators, improve our health. And this is what I feel the Bureau of Indian Affairs has to come back and say to the different Indian communities, we're going to give you X amount of dollars and not just throw the dollar out to like a, you would to your dogs uh, a bone and say fight for it. 
they should say, how much money do you need? Send in your proposal. If you need $250,000 to run an education program on the Yakima Reservation for language and culture, biology, chemistry, I feel this is what, how it should be done to preserve our Yakima language, to preserve our culture, to preserve our ways of the elderly, to bring all of this back. As a prime example is what's happening now. The director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Education Program has sent you people out to video us, to ask us uh, questions that could be meaningful, but yet should be put in reverse so we can preserve what we're doing now so you could take it and use it elsewhere. Now, we should have the same equipment, the budget to have our Yakima language people sit down, elderly, the children, and tell stories and preserve it in one of these fashions for future generations yet unborn. This is the way it was in our treaty. It said by non-Indians again, you're going to get education, you're going to get housing, you're going to get whatever it's going to take for you to be productive citizens in the future. Indian country's been ripped off too much. History, prime example of history. When you sit down and say, what happened to your land? Take a look outside. There's a lot of it's lost. How can we preserve what we lost other than teaching people like uh, myself, Lena Owens, that is uh, a, a, a certificated teacher to teach languages. And we've got to preserve, we've got to have more classes, more money to accomplish this. Money is something that was uh, shoved on to us, getting us to compete, getting us to become like white people, not caring for your neighbor, not caring for what happens to the people down the road, just around the corner. Uh, that's where my job is at Yakima Valley College to and people like myself that could be working elsewhere at other universities to uh, encourage high school students to stay in high school. Again, I feel that if there was more money for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to give to the different tribes to say, you better start, and here's the dollars to start getting people to, even ad adults, basic education, the programs that are around. Get them their reading, their writing, their arithmetic, more of a professionalized scale. The lack of uh, college graduates in in within the Indian community is very minute compared to the non Indian community, where you've got uh, a nation of, uh, what is it, 30 million plus or 60 million? What is our census for the United States now, for Indians and non Indians? And you take a look at 600,000 Indians in the United States. How many do we? How many have PhDs? How many have master's degrees? How many have BA degrees? You can take a look right here on our reservation. How many teachers we've got? But you can sure as hell count the teacher aides we've got. We've got a whole bag full. They should be more teachers. Our teacher aides should be raised up in salary-wise. When you go to work for $2.40 an hour, which amounts to about $3,400 a year, you know, and I wonder why we're not getting what we should be getting out of our, our education programs. Salaries are, things are going up, but except for our teacher aid salaries. Now, if we can get people convinced, not only here, but all over, and we can get more of our students to stay in the college and stay into their professional fields, allied health field. Uh, we're trying to get a program for the Northwest, working with the Indian Health Board and Indian Health Programs throughout the United States to improve our health situations. We don't have the people uh, in these given areas. Allied health is a wide open field. We could expand on that program. How many doctors do we have in the United States? We sure have uh, a lot of LPNs. Uh, nurse aides, but we don't have that specialist. 
doctors, different, different doctors, specialists in these different fields, professors in science, we don't have them, professors of philosophy, we don't have them. The, the law programs have developed, they've blossomed, they've bloomed. We've got a field full of lawyers fighting for Indian rights. Now we've got these rights and the uh, tools to work with it. Let's turn around and get the Allied Health Field working. Principals, teachers. Then when we get all this accomplished, we'll have our languages, our cultures, our history. We'll, we'll be proud again, just like the eagle. Very few eagles left in the United States, bald eagles, where power comes from. Now look at their, they're killing them off the same way we've got to start growing again like the eagles got to grow. Or yeah, our languages are growing, but yet we don't have the mechanisms which comes down to the dollar again to keep improving our programs. I'm afraid what's going to happen to education in the past, Title IV, JOM, Indian education in general, may happen to this Indian health bill. They'll throw it out and say, sick em, sick em. go get them Indians. But we're going to, I think this time we may go at a different approach. We'll group together and we'll say, this is what we want, this is how we're going to get it. We'll go at it as in the past, more like gentlemen's, more like the ladies, with their mannerisms. You never do see Indians out destroying. It's always in the correct manner of Indian way. We didn't start the battle. The battle came to us in the form of non-Indians coming westward. They took, then we went to war. The war started by non-Indians. And again, Indian people do not go out and be militant burn or blow buildings down as it ha shows in San Francisco, California, New uh, LA areas. Renegated uh, people that cause trouble, Indians don't do that. They will if they have to, as they did at uh, from two cultures and you have to decide which two cultures you may want to talk about in this country of cultures of many, Indian people was put into a melting pot theory in the early 20s, thereabouts. Uh, we've got to decide, are we going to take our own Indian culture if we go on to get this education? And what form of education do you want? In order to compete in any given field as being a carpenter, you've got to join a union You've got to have a, be a card-carrying carpenter. You've got to go get an education in that area. In order to be, let's say, a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, again, you've got to go to that chosen school and accept their ed education, but not to take their values of the non-Indian. We'll just leave it at uh, the other would be the non-Indian. But when you come back, you have a medicine man on the reservation. He's a doctor. He's recognized by all Indians in the United States. And their language is Twati. So we have to, as being Indians of the United States, Alaska Natives, to go out and receive that formal education and be competitive in the classroom and not be satisfied with D's or C's or incompletes or withdraws. We've got to be in there, be competing for that A and B, then come back to your chosen field, the chosen reservation or given reservation where you're enrolled at, registered at, and then encourage the youngsters to do so elsewise. Uh, Education as, uh, as a whole is in one hell of a situation uh, from K through 12. Uh, as you can see in a lot of the different states where they've got to rely on the local taxes to receive money to give and offer certain 
educational classes. And when it comes down to the, the highest priority down to the lowest, Indian education will always be at the lowest level of that scale unless the school districts will say, uh, can your tribe pick up this or could the BIA pick up your funding for your Indian education programs? You sit there and you know damn good and well the answer is going to be no and they know damn good and well it's going to be no. So they're going to put you down to pri lowest priority. But if we were in a school district where we weren't the minorities, when I say minorities, Indians generally don't consider them themselves minorities, but yet we're written in on different proposals as minorities. If we were predominant in Wapto School District, Topney School District, White Swan School District, Idaho, one of the Idaho school districts, Arizona, then we could put our Indian history at the top of the list and then put the non-Indians down into low totem pole. But yet, we've got to have that reading and writing and arithmetic, the basic tools in order for our students to carry on and function in a chosen field that they'd like to participate in. So no matter which way we as Indians turn, and the school districts sitting over here, the same situation, we're behind the eight ball. I was going to say a hell of a position, but it wouldn't sound right, but... In the state of Washington, our education programs for Johnson O'Malley, as we call them here and I think other states would be JOM. I'm from the Region 4, which is the Yakima Nation District. From Region 4, the parents are elected to represent the school district that they may came, come from. They, we have our Region 4 that we chose people to be a member of the region, board of directors. Then from the board of directors, we represent two people, our persons, so we don't leave out the ladies. And um, we go from there to the state of Washington, Big 12. And Big 12 there, there's six districts that make up the JOM uh, Big 12 program. In this area, we decide, we help the superintendent of public schools, the public school, to decide what he's going to do with Indian education programs and how we're going to distribute money, how what type of areas we may want to pursue and how to help education for the different Indian communities in the state of Washington develop and grow. We've had uh, various activities that were sponsored by our JOM program, education for our teachers, education for our teacher aides, education for the parents, education for the students. And everything we do, except for maybe our JOM staff, is donated or not donated, but the time is donated by the parents and interested personnel. Uh, we have some of the teachers may want to uh, contribute something on a time basis of coming in and helping us put stuff together, which we've had very few, non-Indians that is. Uh, we monitor our own programs to make sure our school districts are functioning the way we want our money spent. We put in a lot of time and effort to upgrade education for Indian students. We uh, do everything that our students, in order for them to learn, uh, I believe that's just about, this calendar is one of our products of many things we've been able to accomplish in our handbook that uh, we've got that explains a lot of areas that we've been able to accomplish and a lot of harassment from the different school districts, but we've learned to use their tools in reverse. 